Hello and welcome to ESG Talk. We're so glad that you decided to join us today. I'm your host, Mandy McReynolds. Whether you're grabbing a cup of coffee and listening in, watching this from YouTube at your desk, or maybe on your commute, hearing our thoughts around ESG past, present, and future, we're so glad you're here. I am delighted to bring to you our first guest. Tim Mohan has decided to join us. He is the Chief Sustainability Officer for Persephone. And here's three reasons why I am excited that he is a part of our discussion. First and foremost, Tim has just been named that in 2022, LinkedIn top voice in the green economy. So congratulations, Tim. Thank we're you, Mandy. We're so glad that you were honored with that. You've been in the field for a long time. He is an industry spanner like myself, crossing multiple industries. So he has different perspectives of ESG that he'll share with us today. And in addition to that, he's written a book to help all of us think about this called The Inside Out, Changing Business from the Inside Out, A Tree Hugger's Guide to Working in Corporations. There you go. You've got a copy of the book <laughs> for people to see, and we'll get to that. So as you join this first talk, we want to kick it off with some conversation starters. We need to get to know Tim a little bit. So these questions are intended to be really fast, very fun, and for you to have a chance to know who he is. Are you ready, Tim? Are you ready I'm for ready. this? Let's All go. Right, let's get these conversations going. Here we go. These four real quick hits. Previously, you worked for Apple. What was your favorite Apple product? <laughs> my favorite Apple product has to be my phone. I call it my precious because, you know, if you leave a room without it, you have to run back and get it. Mm -hmm. uh, like many people, I'm probably a little too addicted to my iPhone. But yeah, it's the phone. Okay, so when do you go hug the tree and put your phone down? Tell us that real quick. <laughs> <laughs> it goes in my back pocket. There you go. <laughs> quick, you go. quick side story. I worked at Apple when the iPhone came out, and we all went to Steve's announcement. Steve Jobs was alive at the time, and he said, this is going to change the world. And we were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he said, and you're all getting one today. And then we went, yay. Everybody was super excited to get the first iPhone. That is awesome. Well, we'll have to hear more about those life life lessons. So the next question, as uh, everyone is tuning in and we're curious from you, what should we be reading, watching, or listening right now that you are doing? First of all, uh, in the shameless plug department, my newsletter, uh, once a week today, actually on Fridays, uh, we release a newsletter that covers uh, ESG and climate news, not very artful title, but uh, it says what it means. And so there's so much happening in this world. And each week we try to compile the news in a way that's accessible because it is kind of an alphabet soup and hard to understand. So uh, look for that on Fridays. It's on LinkedIn. We're up over 15,000 subscribers now and quite proud of the content. Well, and I love it because it's it's really what I, I think that what I call the person of practice voice, the practitioner, and it, it sort of takes away all the hype and the noise and it gets down to how do you, how do you do this day to day and manage it? And so I, I love for us to keep following it on LinkedIn and keep continuing that conversation. Thank you for being such a practical voice for all of us in the field. As we get to the next one, this is something that I think will be a little more lighthearted. Tell us something that made you laugh this week. Something that made me laugh. Well, it's the same every week. It's my uh, my grandchildren. I have a, uh, uh, a, a well, I have five grandchildren actually, and, and the two of them live nearby. And one of them is uh, four years old, and he is not just adorable but hilarious. So he makes me laugh all the time. Love it. Well, in that age, they're developing, their neurons are connecting, and every day is an adventure. Super curious, too. So thanks for sharing a little bit more, too, about your per personal journey. Now, this one's going to take us a little bit deeper. And I think as somebody who's been an industry spanner, you've been in the career in the space for a while, all of us have had that moment where somebody gives you that one line of advice or that pivotal conversation that really challenges and changes you? What was yours? Yeah, so I, you know, it's a hard question to answer, but when I think back over my many, many years, there's there's one instance that, that comes to the top of mind when you ask me that question. Um, one of my old bosses, a guy named Larry Borgman, unfortunately he's no longer with us. He passed away a few years ago. He was the head of environment, health and safety at Intel Corporation, where I worked for 12 years. 
And at one point in my career at Intel, they promoted me to the head of environmental uh, for the whole corporation, so environmental services. It was, a, it was a massive job. It had lots of different responsibilities, kind of terrifying in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, but Larry was a mentor to me. And he took a great interest in, in not only the, the content of my job, but how I was behaving in the position so that I could uh, rise up through the ranks of leadership. And when somebody does that, you pay attention to what they say. And one day uh, in one of our many one-on-one uh, -on -one discussions, actually in the cafeteria, Larry said to me, you know what, Tim, I want you to do today. I want you to go out and I want you to lose an argument, lose a fight, because you're always so darn sure that you know the right answer. And sometimes you don't. And sometimes even if you do, you have to listen to others. You have to promote their ideas, make them feel included. And that piece of advice, because I actually did it, uh, was one of the best life lessons I've gotten throughout my career, because it, it did force me to take a step back and think, what are what are other people's ideas saying and how can I lift them up and make them feel like they're part of this conversation by actually listening and, and caring and, and, and implementing their ideas. And in doing so, you know, the decisions we made and the content we created was just so much better for the overall organization. So that was my, my little life lesson. I love it. Go pick a fight you're going to lose and, and really <laughs> think through how that other stakeholder can bring knowledge to the table and change the, the direction of an idea. I think in this work, it's so critical and, and you said it so well, when we partner with others, it's not our idea that gets capital, it's the collective that gets capital. And you have to think about what does, you know, whether you're in financial service, what does the asset manager, the longstanding asset manager think versus the employee and the HR department as we think about workforce uh, retention. And when you bring those two perspectives together, not only are you going to advance maybe workforce development, but you also might add to the capital growth of your company. And you need to hear both the pauses, what gives people pause versus just going through with, with the one idea that you think is there. So I love that. Everybody should go lose a fight today. I'm, I'm going to go, <laughs> I'm going to go in the, by the end of the day and I'm going to lose a fight. What great words of wisdom. So let's get, a, we, we did a LinkedIn poll and it was interesting. We asked if for this conversation, where do people want us to focus? And we had talked about preparing the show, doing past, present and future. But those of you that participated in LinkedIn poll, thank you so much. You actually told us, don't talk about the past, talk about the present and the future. And this is your show. So keep uh, connecting with us on LinkedIn as we have guests. Tell us at ESG Talk on Twitter things you want us to talk about, because we will shape the direction based on your advice and where you want the conversation. So originally in this past question, we were looking for you to talk about your book, Changing the Business from the Inside Out, A Tree Hugger's Guide to Working in Corporate America. I love that you wrote this book in the wake of Occupy Wall Street, the mortgage crisis, oil spill, and a high distrust. But given what are uh, those joining the conversation want us to talk about, can you tell us, this book is about 10 years old, what's different now? Move us to the present. How are you thinking about a tree hugger's guide to working in corporate America now? That's a great question. And uh, you know, without dwelling on the past, I think just to set a little context, uh, I wrote the book because I was on the board of an organization called Net Impact. Net Impact, for those of you who don't know, it is a fantastic organization that basically brings young people uh, from uh, MBA business programs and young business professionals who want to work for more than a paycheck together. Uh, and I think it's really inspiring that so many young people have this aspiration. But as I served on that board, I realized that many of these folks really didn't have the practical, tactical steps for thriving in a corporate responsibility job. Uh, and this is something that, you know, I'd sort of grown up in. So I decided I would write it down. Uh, and, and my book is a little bit different in that it is those tactical steps of how to approach a corporate responsibility position and to thrive in such a position. Um, looking at forward, uh, I think that the book needs to be rewritten. You're right. It's old. It's now 10 years old. It still gets taught in many uh, graduate courses, and I still do a lot of lecturing on it. But the good news is 
that what's new is the profession has gotten kicked upstairs. My book, if you really look at the common theme throughout the book, it's about leading through influence because a corporate responsibility practitioner is basically responsible for everything in the company, but has authority over nothing in the company. And that's an incredibly difficult position to be in. So how do you lead through influence to get the results you need in such a job? Nowadays, there is a direct ladder into the C-suite for ESG professionals. That wasn't there 10 years ago. And this is incredible because all of a sudden, people with sustainability in their title, ESG in their title, are, are, are getting positions like chief sustainability officer reporting directly to the CEO. Uh, this brings in a whole new series of skills. It's not just leading through influence anymore. It's about understanding risks and opportunities and integrating those into business plans, presenting those not only to the C-suite, but to the board and getting approval for those to move forward. That's a different skill set than the, the book I wrote. And so I'm kind of excited if I ever get a minute or two to rewrite edition number two of The Tree Hugger's Guide to the Corporate World, which, by the way, that was the original title. The publisher watered it down to changing business from the inside out. Well, and I, and I love where you went with the seat at the table. We, we know from Harvard Business Review, they just did, does your company need an ESG officer? And there was a study that was just released from one of our partners. We'll put it in the show notes. But the growth of the C-suite role was threefold this past year. And so we, you're exactly right. We're seeing uh, three things happen. We're, you're seeing seasoned people who know how to navigate and influence and get work done in the corporation, moving over an ESG team that this is a whole new world for them, right? Like, like they're like, I don't know anything about carbon accounting or, you know, running a foundation to hand raisers that say, I, you know, I've, I'm here, I'm willing to take on this challenge. And in some ways, young and dumb and hopeful, and, you know, we'll get through this. And to a seasoned practitioner who's been at this, for years coming at it. And it's a whole uh, world as they walk into that boardroom in present day or now engaging uh, in investor conversations. And I wonder through your journey, because you've moved from this notion of the seat at the table, that executive role, now a seat at the table, but in technology, as you looked ahead to the future of the field. Tell us about that journey. So, so what you know, you wrote this book thinking about the future. Now you're like, I'm I'm going after tech. So, what problem did you see that you wanted to solve that that moved you in that direction? Yeah, it's a great framing, great question because it really does speak to the evolution of the practice, if you will, and that's what we were talking about before when I started in the corporate world. And by the way. You know, I, I didn't start my career in the corporate world. I was a government regulator for the first 10 years of my career because we really didn't have the words corporate responsibility. They were considered kind of an oxymoron, if you will. Uh, but that that changed. And over time, you know, there was sort of a department of good works, if you will, within the company that was um, where I was. You know, I was trying to kind of move this this massive super tanker a little bit towards doing good for people on the planet through influence primarily. But because it was primarily driven by reputation, let's say, um, or, you know, people run companies, people have hearts, they have conscience, they, they drive these things for other reasons as well. Um, it really was under-resourced. And all of the work that we did was kind of done on spreadsheets, if you will. We, we cobbled together data and we would publish sustainability reports, sometimes as late as six months after the end of the fiscal year. Well, this is not the kind of rigor that is really needed in today's world. As we see ESG crossing the threshold from the sort of reputational practice that it was once was into this um, area of global commerce, where capital market regulators are requiring ESG disclosure, the tools that we had in the past just won't work in the future. And so the company that I'm with now, Persephone, is developing uh, something called carbon accounting software, which, you know, you'd have to really understand this world to really get. 
but essentially automates the process of creating a greenhouse gas footprint that can then be used for not just compliance to the capital market regulators, but also more importantly, for creating strategies to identify risks and opportunities for your company. So I'm incredibly excited and proud to be at a company that's sort of purpose built for the transition that we're seeing throughout the global economy. Well, and I think it's really important, those of us that, that we're in the field and we kind of move to the technology industry. I, I love what you said because how this problem is going to get tackled, the massiveness to add to business value drivers beyond reputation to your company is going to be three T's. It's going to be talent, like we talked about earlier, tech, or a teacher, a consultant, or somebody coming in that's sort of helping you in that journey and, and moving your company forward. And I believe people are going to take a combination of all three. And, and I think we want to think through how do we help get the talent in the door where they need to be focused and where can technology automate? Where can technology help with those board grade, investor grade decision making data that we can have trust and we can have confidence in? And then you got your team fired up to go do more strategic work. You know, when I was that that's what drove me here was this, like I looked at, oh my gosh, Q1 took 563 hours <laughs> of work. And we had an amazing ESG analyst who was so sharp and so smart. And I just thought, what could happen if we could open up the capacity of her time to implement technology on risk scenario testing, like you said, or other things that move beyond what could be automated? So it's a bright future ahead for, for organizations like Workiva, Persephone, Ecovatus, and those of us in the, in the, in the space to think about the talent, the tech, and those teachers coming in to help us. But you're absolutely right to raise the people side of this because I think there's there's both gaps and opportunities in that space as as sustainability, as the practice of ESG moves into the mainstream. It's a wonderful time to actually be in this profession because there's, there's plenty of jobs out there. But as it moves into the mainstream, you're seeing uh, the CFO, the Investor Relations Department, the board, all having a role in sustainability. That's new. And many of those folks have never really encountered these issues. And so companies uh, are looking for qualified people, not just consultants, but, you know, the folks that were working for maybe in obscurity in the corporate responsibility department for many years now have an opportunity to take what they know and to work with the CFO, the board, the C-suite on these issues. And so I, I've, I've been talking about this to a lot of my colleagues over the years who come out of the environment, health and safety world, the corporate responsibility world, and saying, this is your moment. This is your time to shine. Take that knowledge and help to educate those people as we move this into the actual functioning of the business. So for those of us who are listening to you, nodding our head, stepping into this moment, uh, you are so close to what the future and what innovation will be over the next three years. Tell us more. Tell us about the future. What can innovation do for us in the next three years so that we can seize this moment? Yeah, so there, there's um, an entire global transition underway. T decarbonizing the global economy is maybe one of the ma most massive economic shifts we've ever seen. And you're seeing announcement after announcement. I cover this in, in today's newsletter where, you know, just as one example, but a, a pretty massive one, uh, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero or GFANS, also known as the world's worst, worst abbreviation or acronym uh, is uh, is 130 trillion trillion combined asset under assets under management. So over 450 financial institutions got together and they said, we are going to band together and focus our financial might on this decarbonization, this this shift that I'm talking about towards a net zero economy. And just this week, uh, Mark Carney, who co-chairs GFANS, and it was also the um, Secretary of the Bank of England uh, said that they're going to issue a series of uh, guidance and standards to help put some accountability and transparency into those transition plans. And so when you think of that much money moving the global economy, there are opportunities in every sector 
from uh, carbon capture and removal technology to the software industry that Workiva and Persephone work in to all sorts of climate tech across the board. And so whatever your core competency is, whatever business you're in, I think it's it's really now the time to start looking at what is that economy, that that future low carbon economy mean to me as a business? And how do I change my business strategy to take advantage of this coming change? I think that leads so well into our, as time went so fast, our final question where we're calling it the closeout of this conversation. I think you and I could talk all day long. And so just thank you so much for this 20 minutes of an enriching conversation. Forbes top 10 straight traits of innovators. It was written uh, several years back, but I think some of the traits they say still ring true today, like, like your book that you shared. Innovators understand paying too much attention to traditional business metrics can inhibit companies from making breakthroughs. At the same time, however, there are business successes that speak for itself. So I want to know, as we're thinking about the future, what non-traditional metric in ESG do you think we could all pay attention to right now that will lead to a future breakthrough? Yeah, that's such a good question. And it's a, it's a tough one to answer. It, it makes me have to kind of look into my crystal ball. Uh, and, and let me kind of share with you how we approach it at Persephone. And I think this fits with my own values. Um, you, you may be aware of uh, some of the, the sort of fundamental business uh, tomes that are out there, but one of my favorites is uh, Clayton Christensen's The Innovator's Dilemma of how to disrupt an existing practice. That's essentially what we are involved with here uh, with Persephone uh, in trying to change the world uh, and, and actually make money at the same time. So I think it's the, the combination of uh, being a disruptor, but also looking at it from the perspective of uh, doing well while doing good. And and the other one that I would raise in terms of uh, looking forward and, and the skill sets for success, I've always been a follower of uh, the late Colin Powell, who not only was such a terrific leader as Secretary of State and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Chiefs of Staff, but he, in later life, talked a lot about the, the qualities that made him a good leader. And one of the things he said, and if you're a follower like I am, you know he has the sort of 13 uh, management ideas that I, I have stuck to my wall. But one of them is the, the 40 to 70 rule, uh, meaning that if, if the level of certainty in any given decision is between 40% and 70%, then go with your gut. And I think a lot of times, especially in this great transition to a low carbon economy, that's where we're going to be. I mean, right now, things have changed on a dime. But, you know, a few months ago, money was flowing and ESG was on fire. Now we're looking at a potential uh, recession, election, war, uncertainty, and a lot of people are sort of pulling back. You know, these are the kind of things that uh, create uncertainty, but eventually you've got to make a decision. And like all trends, the trend line is, is a squiggly line. It's up, it's down, but it, the, the overall trend line is, is up and to the right. And so I think we as as business leaders have to sort of take a look at those mega trends. What are they telling us and how do we operate and take those risks that are not only going to make ourselves successful, but are also going to contribute to the sustainability of our world. 4070. I love it. <laughs> there's a way there's a metric for <laughs> for all of us today in the discussion. So if you want to continue the conversation with Tim, Tim, I know you're very active on LinkedIn. He referenced his newsletter. We'll make sure ESG and climate news is in our show notes. Uh, you're also having a new podcast live. really quick. Tell us about that. It's called Sustainability Decoded with Tim and Caitlin. My co-host Caitlin is a 20 something female. And the reason that it is decoded is that Caitlin will ask questions that I would never think of. And I think this is phenomenal. It's about inspiring and informing the next generation of leaders who are just so eager. I find it inspiring to to be involved in the sustainability movement. And so Caitlin is is fabulous. She asks these great questions and we often get into issues that go well beyond the scope of ESG into things like how to uh, be a successful female leader. Uh, that, uh, again, I, I just find uh, inspiring as Caitlin asks those questions. So 
That's the new podcast, Sustainability Decoded with Tim and Caitlin. It'll be dropping in about a week. And we're very, very excited about uh, getting started on our own podcast. Tim, thanks so much for joining the discussion with myself and all those here with us today. We're excited for our next show. We're going to chat about a recent uh, report that was released, ESG State of Play, Banks Compliance and Automated Reporting Trends. Everyone will talk real soon. Thanks for joining us.